So 2 Kings chapter 3, if you can turn there in your Bibles, this is a very simple practical teaching. And in that, there are going to be a bunch of things that we can pull out, some things that we don't want to apply to our lives and some things that we do want to apply to our lives. But before we jump in, I want to give you some backstory about where we are in the nation of Israel's history. So I'm going to put up a map. At this point, the nation of Israel is divided into two. There we go. The northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. The reason the country has divided is the northern kingdom of Israel has kind of given itself to idol worship. They've jumped full on into kind of pushing God out of their country, and they are worshiping idols. The kingdom of Judah held on a little longer. They worshiped God for a while. Eventually, they will fall full on into idol worship as well. But we are dealing with a split nation at this point. Also, just to the east is the kingdom of Moab, and to the south, the kingdom of Edom. Those will kind of be the key players in our story today as we study through this passage of Scripture. So we have a divided kingdom. Uh, Last time I taught, we talked about the prophet Elijah. Elijah is considered one of the greatest prophets in all of Israel. And so Elijah, um, at this point, had been called into heaven, and so he goes to heaven Um, and Elisha was called to take over his spot. So before Elisha goes to heaven, he pours himself into Elisha, prepares him for ministry, and now Elisha has kind of taken over. In 1 Kings chapter 19, it says about Elijah, it says, so he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, while he was plowing with the 12 pairs of oxen before him, and he with the 12. And Elijah passed over him and threw his mantle on him, and he left his oxen and ran after Elijah. So I think it's important to say that because just like Elijah, Elisha was just a normal guy. It says that when Elijah went to find him, he was out there plowing his fields. He had his oxen. He had all of his stuff. He's out there plowing his fields. He was just a farmer doing his job. And God says, he is the guy that we are going to replace you with. And so Elijah goes out and throws his mantle or his cloak on him to symbolize that he's calling him to follow him and serve with him. In James chapter 5, it says about Elijah, he was a man like a, with a nature like ours. And I think it's important for us to realize this because I think sometimes we struggle to see if and how God could use ordinary people like us. But scripture is filled with tons of stories of ordinary people like you and I doing ordinary things when they are called by God to do that. And so we need to remember that these are just ordinary people doing extraordinary things because they were obedient in following God and taking steps in their relationship with him. The name Elisha means God is salvation. It also says in scripture that he requested a double portion of Elijah's spirit. And in scripture, there's actually exactly two times the amount of miracles listed for Elisha than there is for Elijah. So I found that interesting. And the last thing we'll say about Elisha is that when he decided to follow God, he was all in. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 21, it says he took the pair of oxen and sacrificed them, boiled their flesh with the implements of the oxen, and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and ministered to him. So Elisha literally gave up everything to follow God. There was no going back. He said he got rid of his animals, they ate them, he got rid of all of his tools, he burned them, and he was all in to follow God and to serve Elijah. So as we jump into 2 Kings chapter 3 today, we're going to see three parts of the teaching. The first 10 verses or so are going to deal with the two kings of Israel and Judah and a series of bad mistakes that they make. I've called the first part part of this teaching Jehoram and Jehoshaphat's five keys to making bad mistakes or bad decisions. Five keys to making bad decisions. This is not things that we want to apply to our lives, but things that we want to learn from. I feel like that needs to be stated, unfortunately. So as we're going through this, just remember, we want to learn from their mistakes and not to apply these to our life because Elisha will come in and save the day later on as we will find out in just a moment. So in verse one, we're gonna jump in. It says, now Jehoram, the son of Ahab, became the king over Israel and Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, and reigned for 12 years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, though not like his father and his mother. For he put away the sacred pillar of Baal, which his father had made. Nevertheless, he clung to the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which had made Israel sin, he did not depart from them. So in this passage, we are introduced to Jehoram, who is the king of the northern, is, the northern kingdom of Israel. We know that his father was King Ahab. Now, when we talked about Elijah a few weeks ago, we said that Ahab was referred to in the Bible as most, one of the most wicked kings of all time. So Ahab was a very bad guy. What made him worse was his wife, Jezebel, was one of the most wicked women in all of scripture. She was known for killing prophets. Uh, She tried to kill Elijah. She killed hundreds of prophets of God uh, during her time as queen. 
and show she was pure evil. At this point, they were all in on Baal worship. It does say that Jehoram ended Baal worship. He would have watched Elijah call down fire from heaven and kill uh, the, they killed the prophets of Baal, and so he saw Baal as kind of this evil thing. So he did get away from that, but it does say he encouraged his nation into other idols that they would worship, and so he encouraged idol worship. The other person we, king we hear about is Jehoshaphat, who's the king of the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, Jehoshaphat was a somewhat godly king. It says that he followed God, um, but we'll see that in his life, he fails to really seek God out throughout his life. And so there are some things that will come up. He also lets his people kind of make the decision for themselves. So while he worshiped God, if they wanted to worship idols, he would kind of turn his back and just kind of let them do their thing. So he was kind of a godly king, but not really the best ruler uh, during this time. So those are our two kings that we're dealing with. They're going to join and form an alliance to go to war together, as we'll find out in just a moment. So on your outline, we're gonna outline a couple keys to making bad decisions. Number one is that you're influenced by people who make bad decisions. You are influenced by people who make bad decisions. I think some of us can say that we have been influenced in the past about people that made bad decisions. Maybe they spoke into a decision you had to make and it didn't end up well. Or maybe somebody has people in their lives now who wanna speak into their lives and they're known for making bad decisions. They tend to be the vocal ones that wanna offer their opinion and you have to make a decision. Am I gonna listen to those people or not? One key to making bad decisions is we are influenced by other people who make bad decisions. Decisions. In Proverbs verse four, chapter 14, verse seven, it says, leave the presence of a fool or you will not discern words of knowledge. You see, we become like the people we surround ourselves with. Are you surrounding yourself with people that you want to emulate their life and you want to be like them? Or are we surrounding ourselves with people that are the fools that the Bible talks about that are not gonna lead us in the direction that we want us to go or more importantly, that God wants us to go in life? Keep tuning on in verse four. It says, now Misha, the king of Moab, was a sheep breeder and used to pay the king of Israel 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. But when Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel and King Jehoram went about out of Samaria at that time and mustered all of Israel. So Misha was the king of Moab. They used to pay this tax to Israel that stopped Israel essentially from attacking them and taking them over. So instead of doing that, we'll give you 1,000 lambs every year the, the wool of a thousand lambs is kind of a tax that will pay for your protection not to come in and attack us. Well, once Ahab died, Misha, the king of Moab, kind of felt like the threat was over. I'm not really worried about Jehoram and him attacking us and killing us. So we're just gonna stop paying that tax. And this made Jehoram very angry. It says that he goes throughout Samaria and musters all of Israel. You see, conflict in Israel, it's obviously nothing new if you look at the world today. Most of the world is against Israel. It's been that way for thousands of years through their existence, off and on. Uh, but it's not a new problem for them. But Jehoram becomes very angry and he says he leaves Samaria, the capital of Israel, and starts mustering all of Israel. He starts getting people ready to go to battle. And so number two, the second key to making bad decisions is that you make decisions out of anger. You make decisions out of anger. He was furious that they stopped paying this tax and that they didn't see him as a threat. So he wanted to kind of flex his muscle and prove a point here, and he makes this very bad decision. Let me ask you guys, have any of you guys ever made a decision out of anger before? Yeah. yeah. So some of you are being honest, some of you are lying, because all of us, <laughs> it's fine. But how did, those, how did those decisions turn out for you? Right? That never tends to turn out well. Can I, can I share a story with you? So let me share a story. Uh, we well, got the list anyway, so that's fine. Um, so I've shared the story before, but this is one of my favorite stories about a lesson that I learned uh, as a teenager. So if you grew up in my house, you knew that Sunday was church day, right? So no, no doubts about it. On Sunday, you got up and you went to church. There was never an excuse unless you're like dying to not go to church. So I bought tickets with a couple of buddies of mine to go to this concert down in West Palm Beach at the time. And uh, so I told my parents that morning, I woke up and I said, Hey guys, I'm gonna to go to this concert, I'm not going to church. My dad says, yes you are. And I said, no I'm not. And he said, yes you are. And I said, no I'm not. So we had that old classic father-son teen duel. You guys ever dealt with that before? Yeah, my kids are like nine and 10. I'm on that three year Jesus is coming back plan before they turn 14. <laughs> so just, just praying and waiting for that one. So we had this standoff and my dad says, look, you don't have to go to church today, but he goes, you're gonna stay home and you're grounded for the foreseeable future. And I said, fine, I'm not going to church. I'm staying home. And so he, he, they said, that's fine. And my mom and dad walk out the door, and so I turn around. I had a decision to make, right? I'm angry. I see this bucket of paint on the ground. We're doing some remodeling in the house, right? 
And so I decide, in all my infinite wisdom, to kick this bucket of paint, one gallon bucket. <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever kicked a bucket of paint before. The lid doesn't stay on, it pops off. And so paint goes all over our living room. I'm talking carpet, tile, entertainment center. My dad had surround sound system, like all in the speakers, TV, wall, fireplace, you name it. I mean, complete redecoration, remodeling job. <laughs> awesome. So I remember doing that, and I'm sitting there looking at this mess, and I'm like, oh my goodness. At that time, my sister walked out of her room right above the living room and looked down, and, she, and she, I said, I need your help. And she laughs and goes, <laughs> good luck. And she turns around and walks back into her room. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there looking at this mess, and I'm like, how am I going to clean this up? You know, I've only got a couple hours. So my parents come back, and lo and behold, about three seconds later, my front door opens. Who comes walking in but my dad. So he walks in, he sees the mess, doesn't say a word, he turns around, walks back out the front door, <laughs> goes and tries to convince my mom to go to church. <laughs> now, for you women in here, your instincts kick in and say, something's wrong, and so she comes back in the house, she starts teasing the mess, she starts bawling, crying that this happened, and so I spend the rest of the day trying to clean up this mess, and for like 20 years, as they phased out all that stuff for their house, like there was paint everywhere on, on their entertainment center, on their, on their thing, and it's just, <clears throat> it always reminds me when I talk about things like this, of the stupid decisions we make out of a blind rage when we're angry. And so here Jehoram in this story is so angry that they stopped paying this tax that he's literally ready to lead his nation into battle just to prove a point. So we tend to make bad decisions out of anger. In verse seven, tensions are on the rise. It says, then he went, Jehoram went to send word to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, saying, the king of Moab has rebelled against me. <clears throat> will you go with me to fight against Moab? And he said, I will go up. Underline, I am as you are. My people as your people, my horses as your horses. And so Jehoshaphat was kind of the spineless king of Judah. Jehoram comes and says, look, I want you to go war with me. And he says, whatever you need, my people are your people. Let's do this. Now, the interesting thing is, this isn't the first time Jehoshaphat has been put in this position. I'm not gonna ask you to turn there. We're gonna put a few verses up on the screen from 1 Kings chapter 22. And it says this, when Jehoram's dad Ahab was king of, of Israel. It said, and Ahab said to Jehoshaphat, will you go with me to battle Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses are your horses. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. I feel like it's a replay, a spoiler alert. It did not work this time, so it's probably not gonna work the next time you're called to do this. And so he says, look, we're all in. I will join you and go to battle. So on your outline, the key to make, third key to making bad decisions is that you don't learn from past mistakes. You don't learn from past mistakes. I think it's important to note that we need to learn from our mistakes. We don't dwell in our mistakes. We don't let our mistakes define who we are. But we are to learn from our mistakes. What did we do wrong? What could we have done different going forward? And Jehoshaphat obviously didn't do that. So before they go into battle, Ahab and Jehoshaphat have this conversation. They decide to seek a prophet. So they go to seek God. They wanna see what God has to say about this battle. And so they go seek a prophet. The prophet says, do not go to war. If you go to war, Ahab, you will die. And so that stopped them from going to war, right? Right? right. Wrong, right? <laughs> so you would think that you're facing certain death if you disobey God. No, nope, they decide to go to war anyway. So Ahab comes up with this master plan. He says, look, the prophet says don't go to war. I'm gonna do what I want anyway. So he says, in 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 30, it says, the king of Israel, Ahab, said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go into battle, but you put on your robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. And so Ahab comes up with this elaborate plan. He says, look, I'm gonna disguise myself so nobody knows who I am. What I want you to do, Jehoshaphat, is put on your kingly robes so you have this large target on your back and they come and kill you instead of me. And you know what Jehoshaphat says? Great idea. I love it. Let's do it. And so they go to battle and that's what happens. So on your outline, the fourth key to making bad decisions is that you listen to unwise counsel. You listen to unwise counsel. You see, sometimes in life we are seeking an answer and a lot of times, we already know the answer to the question. But we still seek the people that will say what we want, them, want us to hear, right? So some, you go to somebody and say, no, don't do that. They go to the next person, no, don't do that. You go to the next person, they say, yeah, it sounds like a good idea. They're like, thank you. 
and they go and do it. But they're listening to unwise counsel. Who are the people that you are allowing to speak into your life? There's a lot of people that will offer you counsel when you're facing a situation, but you do not have to listen to them. Seek the people in your life that you want to emulate, that you want to be like. If it's spiritual, seek the people that spiritually you see as somebody that can help you be better. If it's business, seek the person that has a successful business. You don't want to go after the guy that's failing. Seek wise counsel. And so Jehoshaphat is listening to unwise counsel. In Proverbs 13, 20, it says, he who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. <clears throat> and so how does the story end? First Kings chapter 22, verse 34, it says, now a certain man drew his bow at random and struck the king of Israel in the joint of the armor. So Ahab dies just as the prophet had predicted. And so Jehoshaphat lives through this situation, but you think he would learn from this situation. So you fast forward a couple years, Jehoram comes down and says, hey, Jehoshaphat, I want you to go with war, to war with me. And Jehoshaphat says, my people are your people. My army is your army. Let's do this. We will go to war together. So back in 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 8, it says, Jehoshaphat said, which way shall we go up? And Jehoram answered, the way of the wilderness of Edom. So Jehoram comes up with a strategy this time, but you'll notice before they go to battle, they never seek God first. They come up with this wise plan in their own mind, and it's actually a decent plan on paper. We're gonna put up a map and kind of illustrate what they've come up with. So Samaria is the, the capital of Israel. It says that they're gonna head south through Judah, so Jehoshaphat, or Jehoram knew he had to get Jehoshaphat on board. And then they're gonna go south through Edom. Edom at this point was subject to Judah. They had kind of a similar tax thing going on, so Judah said that we're not gonna attack Edom. But Edom had to then get on board. And so all three of these nations are gonna come around the Dead Sea and attack Moab from the south. Moab at this time would have been fortifying their northern border, expecting Israel to attack and to attack from the north because it's the direct shot straight into Moab. And so they said, we're gonna kind of flank them, come around from the south and attack them. Now it's a decent plan on paper, but a couple of things you don't note is that Edom, that south part of the Dead Sea and into Moab is all desert. Okay, so there's no water, no food, and they forget to take that into account. And so they come up with a strategy, they don't seek God, but your fifth key to making bad decisions is you don't seek God first. You don't seek God first. See, I think for many of us, God tends to be our backup plan. We'll go into and make a decision on our own and hope God, that God honors it, and then when things go south, who's the first person we call on for help? We then go back to God and say, God, can you help me fix my mess? We could have avoided the mess in the first place if you're seeking him first. So in verse nine, it goes on to say, so the king of Israel went with the king of Judah and the king of Edom, and they made a circuit of seven days journey, and there was no water for the army or for the cattle that followed them. Then the king of Israel said, alas, the Lord has called these three kings to give them into the hands of Moab. Um, and so they believe at this point that their life is over. God called them into, the, into battle to give them over into the hands of Moab, that God is going to allow us to die as a punishment for our sin and for the things that we have done. So on your outline, the results of our bad decisions, we live with the consequences. We live with the consequences. You see, we have freedom in Christ. That doesn't mean when we make bad decisions, we are free from our consequences of our bad decisions. We serve a gracious God who will certainly step in and help us, but we still live with the consequences of our bad decisions, and their consequences, they were basically ready to die and be turned over into the hands of Moab. So at this time, Elisha is about to enter the picture. So things are heading south, they're going very bad for the, the war hasn't even started, and they're already prepared to give up and die. So this next section, we're gonna learn kind of Elisha's key for building our faith. These are things, the steps that we need to be taking in our life to prepare ourselves and to grow our faith. So in verse 11, it goes on to say, but Jehoshaphat said, is there not a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the king of Israel's servants answered him and said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat is here, who used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. And in verse 12 it says, Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. So things are going bad. They finally make a good decision and say, let's seek out a prophet and let's seek the Lord and see what the Lord has to say about this situation. So Elisha's key to spirit-filled faith, number one, the first thing that they say about as soon as Elisha's name is mentioned is that the word of the Lord is with him. So number one is that the word of God 
is with you. The word of God is with you. If we are going to be men and women of faith, we have to be rooted and grounded in God's word. When people look at you, do they say, oh, you are a, per, a person, a man, a woman of faith or of the word? Or are they saying you're a person that has nothing to do with God's word? When, as soon as they mentioned Elisha's name, they said the word of the Lord is with, with him. In Psalm chapter one, verse one through three, it's how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither, and whatever he does, he prospers. Those are the promises for the men and women of God that are grounded in God's word. And so is God's word your Sunday morning thing, or is it a Monday through Sunday thing for you? We have to ground ourselves in God's word and be men and women who know the word of God, who are writing it on our heart. So in 2 Kings chapter three, it goes on to say, verse 13, now Elisha said to the king of Israel, what do I have to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. And the king of Israel said to him, no, for the Lord has called these three kings together to give us into the hand of Moab. And so Elisha says, I don't even know why you're here, Jehoram. He says, you worship other gods. You don't want anything to do with God, and here you are asking him for help? He says, go back to the gods of your mother and father. Go worship them, go ask them for help. I'm sure they'll show up and help you. And then in verse 14, it goes on, it says, Elisha said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look at you nor see you. And I love this reminder for us because Elisha says, look, I'm standing in front of the three most powerful men in the world. And he says, I'm standing before God. He is the one that I have to answer to. It's not you guys. He said, in fact, if it weren't even for Jehoshaphat, who's at least somewhat godly, I wouldn't even be here. But because of him, God has told me to come and be a part of this meeting. So the second key to having spirit-filled faith is that you recognize the power and presence of God in your life. We recognize the power and presence of God in our lives. He says, look, it's not you guys I answer to, but it is God. And he recognizes his place with him. In Galatians chapter five, verse 16, Paul says, but I say, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. And I love the analogy of walking in the spirit for a couple of reasons. The first one is there is nowhere you can go that he isn't there. As you walk, as you wander, as you walk in faith, as you make mistakes and you wander away, it says that if you are a follower of God, the spirit is with you. Psalm 139 verse seven says, where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? There is nowhere you can go that the spirit won't follow you. And the second thing is, as we walk, we are taking steps. And we talk about next steps of faith all the time here at Calvary. All of us have a next step to take. For some it's big, for some it's small. When we studied Elijah a couple weeks ago, we talked about how, God, how Elijah had to be obedient in the small steps before he could be obedient in the big steps. If he did not take the small steps, he never would have been prepared to face the prophets of Baal. Had he not gone where God called him to go and just taken that simple step of, of leaving the country and going somewhere else and then going to meet the widow, had he not done those things, he never would have been prepared to be used by God during those big tests. So we have to be taking steps of faith. And the second thing I take from this passage is that last section of verse 14, it says, were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look at you nor see you. See, Jehoshaphat was a more godly king who chose to worship God. He says, because of him, God is going to show you grace. But if it weren't for him, God would want nothing to do with you because you want nothing to do with God. Isaiah 59, verses one and two, Isaiah puts it this way. He says, behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. You see, there's a direct correlation between God speaking into our life and stepping in and intervening on in our behalf and our relationship with him. Is our sin or disobedience getting in the way of our relationship with God? It says, look, he hears you. But if you want nothing to do with him every day of your life, how can you expect him to show up in your moment of need? We need to be living a life that is honoring to God, that's obedient to God. We're not gonna be perfect, but seeking God and taking steps of faith, and God will show up and he will meet every need. But we have to be seeking him and not just saying, I'm gonna live life on my terms, 
on my expectations, and then when I screw up, I'm just gonna keep calling on God to come fix my problems. I think many of us live our life that way. Verse 15, it goes on to say, but now bring me a minstrel, which is a musician, and it came about when the, when the minstrel played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. You see, Elisha knew the power of worship and the power of music, and so he says, bring a musician. Then it says, once the musician played, that's when the Lord began to speak to Elisha. You see, music stirs our soul. This is why we start church with worship. It puts us in the right frame of mind to receive the word. As we worship God through the teaching, we worship God through music. There are over 50 commands to sing praises in scripture. There are over 400 references to music in scripture. Music is a key way of how we worship God and we praise God. And so he calls for the musician to come so he can put in the right frame of mind, and then God begins to speak with him. So the third key to spirit-filled faith is that we need to keep an attitude of worship. We need to keep an attitude of worship. He realizes the importance of music, has the music play, and then God begins to speak to Elisha. In Ephesians chapter five, it's put this way. It says, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Continuing on in verse 16, it says, Elisha shares the word of God that God gave him. It says, he said, thus said the Lord. When you see that in scripture, that's the stamp of approval, 100%. This is what God said, and this is what will happen. Thus says the Lord, make this valley full of trenches. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain, yet that valley shall be filled with water, so that you shall drink both you and your cattle and your beasts. This is but a slight thing in the sight of the Lord. He will also give the Moabites into your hand. Then you shall strike every fortified city and every choice city and fell every good tree and stop all springs of water and mar every good piece of land with stones. So at this point, Elisha says, God wants you to start getting out your shovels and start digging trenches. And this would have been very hard for the army to hear because remember, they've traveled seven days, they ran out of water, their cattle are dying, they're dehydrated and they're tired and now it's time to get out the shovels and start digging trenches in the desert. All while, There is zero sign of rain on the horizon. Because God says, I'm gonna send the water, but there won't be wind, there won't be rain. You just have to trust that I'm going to send the water. And so these men who weren't even followers of God, they worshiped all their false idols, are now being called to listen to a God that they don't worship and trust a God they don't worship and start digging these trenches. See, the definition of faith, and we talk about this all the time, is Hebrews 11.1, 1, and it's on your outline. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. So they had no reason to believe God was gonna answer this prayer, that God was going to send the water because they didn't even worship that God. But God said, if you want me to step in, here's what you have to do. You have to start digging these trenches. So the fourth key to spirit-filled faith is that effective faith requires action. Effective faith requires action. I think so many times we want to stand here in our comfortable life and say, God, I need you to bless me, but we refuse to take the step of faith. You see, God says, I will do these things for you, but you have a part to play. I will meet your need, but what are you going to do to help me accomplish that? You can't just sit there and expect him to do things for you without you taking steps of action. If they didn't dig the trenches, The water goes right by and they get no blessing at all. So they had to take action, put their faith into action. I love this analogy in scripture in Luke chapter 12, verse 24, Jesus is talking and he says, consider the ravens for they neither sow nor reap. They have no storeroom, no barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than the birds? And the reason I love this analogy is because it says, look, God will provide for ravens. What makes you think he won't provide for you? But here's the thing. He says, look, I'm not gonna come to the nest and drop the worm off in the nest for you. The raven has to go out and seek the provision. So God says, I will provide for them, but there is a step that they need to take in order to go receive the provision. It's the same thing for you and I. We have steps that we need to be taking so that God can continue to provide and continue to meet those needs. The other thing I love about this passage is that the amount of blessing they would receive is directly related to how much action they took. They could have walked out there and dug a little hole and God would have filled it with water or they could have dug the whole valley into trenches and God would have sent them abundance, plenty of water, but it was directly tied to how much action they took 
and how much they trusted God to provide. See, I think for many of us, we tend to focus on our problem. The issue gets right in front of us, and that becomes what we focus on. But we forget the Bible is filled with promises about how God wants to meet your needs, how God wants to fulfill these things in your life. Do we believe him for a little bit, or do we believe him for abundance? How differently would our life look if we actually believed God when he says these promises? Instead of going to God and asking, God, will you please heal me, you go to God and thank him for the healing that he promises in scripture. When he says, I am the Lord who heals you. When he says, I am the Lord that will provide and meet every need for you, are you praying, asking, are you praying and believing for abundance, going out and digging those trenches, putting the work in so that God can continue to bless you abundantly beyond what you can imagine? What is your view of God? In your situation, how are you believing God to show up? So Elisha reminds them, forget how tired and thirsty you are. Although you can't see the promise, get out there and start digging trenches and look past your current situation and receive the blessing from God. So in verse 20, we start to see the results of their obedience. As in it happened in the morning about the time of the offering of the sacrifice, that behold, water came by the way of Edom and the country was filled with water. So just as God said, there was no storm, there was no wind, there was no rain. God sent water supernaturally from Eden, Edom and filled the trenches. So the first result of their obedience is that God used the miracle to meet their immediate need. God used the miracle to meet their immediate need. Their immediate need was they were thirsty. God sent water and said, drink. As long as you take action and you take the step and you dig the trenches, I'll send the water and then you can drink. And so because they were obedient and they did that, their need was met. Verse 21, the blessing continues. And this is what I love about God. He doesn't just meet their need. He goes above and beyond what they asked for. It says, now all the Moabites heard that the kings had come up to fight against them. And all who were able to put on armor and older were summoned and stood on the border. They arose early in the morning and the sun shone on the water and the Moabites saw the water opposite to them as red as blood. Then they saw this blood. Then they said, this is blood. The kings have surely fought together. And they have slain one another. Now, therefore, Moab to the spoils. So the Moabites come to, the, come to battle. They come over the hill and they look down the valley and the sun is rising. And the field of battle is blood red. Remember, it didn't rain. So they have no idea there would be water filling this valley that's never had water in it before. And so they come over and they see this blood red liquid all over the battlefield. And they, surely they have turned against each other. Israel and Judah and Edom have all killed each other to Moab, the spoil. And so they drop their spears, they drop their protection, and they rush down into the field of battle to begin spoiling the tents and receiving the spoil. So the second result of their obedience was that God used the miracle to confuse the enemy. So God used the miracle to provide for their immediate need, and then God used the same miracle to confuse the enemy. So they rush in to loot Instead, they're met with a battle. And it says, Moab runs in. In verse 24, it says, but when they came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites arose and struck the Moabites so that they fled before them. And they went forward into the land, slaughtering the Moabites. Thus, they destroyed the cities and each one threw a stone on every piece of good land and filled it. So they stopped all the springs of water and felled the good trees until Kir Hereseth. Only they left its stones. However, the slingers went about went about it and struck it. So the third result of their obedience is that God used the miracle to give them the victory. God used the miracle to give them a victory. So I think for us, when we look at this story, we see a group of people that went to battle without God. They then go back and seek God and say, God, what can we do now? And instead of God just providing what they needed, he goes above and beyond. He provides them with, with water. He says he uses that water to confuse the enemy, and then he gives them the victory over the Moabites. He went far beyond what they even asked for. And my question for you is, is that your view of our God? When you are seeking God for provision, when you're seeking God for something in your life, are you believing that God is who he says he is in scripture? When he makes promises and lays them out in scripture, are you believing that in your life? Or do we have a small picture of God that says, I don't even know if he's listening to me. Or if he is listening, I don't even know that he's gonna do this for me. Where is our faith? Where is our faith? I love the verse in Ephesians chapter three, verse 20. It's one of my favorite verses in all of scripture. 
Talking about God, it says, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Is that your view of God? See, that word in the Greek is a double compound word. It's uper ek perisu is the Greek word. So it's multiple Greek words combined that we translate in scripture to exceedingly abundantly above. But if you were to take that double compound word and actually lay it out in English, This is how you would literally translate that word. It it is a God who is very, extremely, extraordinarily, abundantly above all that we ask, hope, or imagine. So is that your view of God? When we are seeking him, asking him for whatever it is, the situation that you're facing, do you believe that about him? that he is very extremely, extraordinarily, abundantly above gonna do things in your life. You see, for some of us as followers of Christ, God has called us to take a step of obedience. And for some of us, that's why we are no longer hearing from him because he has said, look, I want you to take your step. I will provide for you, I will meet your need, I will give you the blessing, I will give you more than you can even think of or imagine. But you need to take a step. So for some of us, we have to go back and say, God, what was the last step you asked me to take? For some of us, it might be something simple. For some of us, it might be something extremely terrifying. But God is calling you to take a step. Will you be obedient? Will you start digging the trenches so God can provide the promise? God can provide the blessing. For some of us in this room today, we have never taken the first step. We've never given our life to Christ. And that is the very first step to receive God's blessing, to receive God's grace, to receive, to receive God's promises is to give our lives to Christ. And I encourage you before you leave today to find a prayer partner up front, go to the next step room and get that settled with God today. You see, Jesus came and died for us, paid the ultimate sacrifice so that we could have a relationship with him so that God could continue to meet our needs above what we can ha- ask, hope, or imagine. So is that our picture of God? And as we leave this place this week, My prayer is that whatever situation you are facing, you are choosing to believe God for so much more because that's who the Bible says he is. It's not somebody that I hope is listening or somebody that might listen. He is somebody that says, I will do more than you're even asking for. When you dig the trenches, I'm gonna give you the water, I'm gonna meet your needs, I'm gonna confuse your enemy, and I'm gonna give you the victory. Is that your belief about God today? Let's pray. Jesus, we're so grateful for your word, and God, that in such simple stories, we can pull out so many truths and applications for our lives, God, that as followers of Christ, God, you have so much more in store for us than we could ask, hope, or imagine. So God, I pray that as we leave this place this week, God, and we enter a world that is hurting, God, that you will use us to be your light in this world, that we will be gracious to those who need it, Father, that you will speak through us, that you will love through us this week, Father. But God, I pray for those in this room right now that are watching online, Father, that have never given their life to you at all. That your spirit will draw them in, that you bring them to the point where they realize that that is the next step that I have to take and I need to do it today. So God, I pray that your spirit is moving. God, that you go before us this week. That we seek you every day, that we be people firmly planted by the stream in your word. And Jesus, we know that your promise and your word is so much more than we'd ask, hope, or imagine. And we are grateful for that. So I just pray for each one in here, whatever situation they're facing, that they're going to choose faith. They're gonna choose to stand up and believe you, although they can't see past the issue, they can't see the storm coming, they can't see the promise of what you're sending, God, that we'll choose to believe. And we'll be obedient to you and your calling and your steps to take in our life. Go before us this week. Keep us safe. We love you. It's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.